Please listen. When I ask you to listen to me and you start giving me advice, you have not done what I asked. When I ask you to listen and you begin to tell me why I shouldn't feel that way, you are trampling on my feelings. When I ask you to listen to me and you feel you must do something to solve my problem, you have failed me, strange as that may seem. Listen, all I ask is that you listen. Don't talk or do anything else. Just listen. Advice is cheap. For 20 cents, I can get both Dear Abby and Billy Graham in the same newspaper. And I can do things for myself. I'm not helpless, maybe discouraged and faltering, but not helpless. When you do something for me that I can and need to do for myself, you contribute and you only contribute to my fear and inadequacy. But when you accept as a simple fact that I feel what I feel, no matter how irrational, then I can stop trying to convince you and get about the real business of understanding what's behind this irrational feeling. And when that's clear, the answers are obvious. And I don't need advice. Irrational feelings make sense when we understand what's behind them. Perhaps that's why prayer works. Sometimes for some people. Because God is silent. And He doesn't give advice or try to fix things. God just listens and lets you work it out for yourself. So please listen. Please listen. Just hear me. And if you want to talk, wait a minute for your turn. And I will listen to you. My dear friends, I began with this because uh, the author, I don't know, this is not mine, all these words are not mine, but I remember reading it somewhere and I liked it so much that I wrote it down. And uh, I thought, let me begin with this because it's so clear what we are talking about. This video is about active listening, active listening, also called paraphrasing. But before we go to active listening, let's talk a little bit about listening itself. What is listening? Have you ever been in a situation <clears throat> where you were visiting a friend and uh, you visit, you're visiting them to uh, see their little baby, um, you know, born a few months old, uh, which, and that when you go there, the baby is in uh, the next room is in the bedroom and you are sitting in the living room and you are talking and uh, your friend and your friend's wife and you know, maybe a couple of other children and whatnot, uh, you are there, your family is maybe, you may, maybe you went with your family. So the point I'm making is that in this living room there is a whole bunch of people uh, and they are talking and so on, you are having a good time and then that little baby in the next room makes a little noise, makes a small sound. Will you hear it? I don't think so. Will anyone in that room hear it? Yes. Who? The mother. The mother. Now, do me a favor. When that happens, when this thing happens to you the next time, ask the mother which listening skills workshop she attended. Mothers don't need listening skills workshops. 
The reason they don't need listening skills workshops is because they are mothers. Because listening is not so much about technique, but it's much more and it begins with deciding to be interested and to have concern. Mothers are great listeners because there's nobody, including the father, there's nobody who's more concerned about their baby than the one who gave birth to that baby, and that's the mother. So listening is not so much about technique, it's about deciding to be interested and to have concern. Listening is also, now we are not talking about mother-child situation, we are talking about um, adult situations, we are talking about maybe conflictful situations, we are talking about maybe potentially stressful situations, where listening is an, an, is an indication of self-confidence. I do a lot of um, work here in America with interfaith groups, interfaith communication. And in that context, I've been invited <coughs> to speak and to give sermons uh, in churches and so on. Now, by definition, an interfaith group consists of people with very, very different beliefs. So if you're talking about Christians and Muslims and, and Jewish people and Hindus and whoever, you're talking about people who have, who come from different religious uh, backgrounds. They have different, in some cases, very uh, almost antagonistic uh, beliefs. The uh, What a Muslim believes is uh, the opposite sometimes of what somebody else believes and vice versa. Also given the cultural and racial mix, especially in the United States, uh, an, a, a typical interfaith group can have people from uh, different nationalities, different cultures, different races, they look different, uh, they dress differently, they walk and talk differently. Uh, although all of us uh, usually speak English, but we also speak other languages. And even the English we speak uh, comes in different accents, right? Now, how do you uh, communicate positively in that situation? Where Almost everything about the people you are speaking to is not just different, but in some cases very diametrically, diametrically different from what you are and who you are and what you believe in. You cannot do that if you don't have confidence. You cannot do that if you are not rooted deeply in what you believe in. But yet, you are opening to listening. You are open <coughs> to listening you're open to considering things different from the way you believe. And believe it or not, you're open to changing your attitude or your opinion about somebody or something. Only then can communication happen. So listening is not so much about technique, it's more about deciding to be interested and listening is about self-confidence. We don't listen when we are afraid. <clears throat> now, listening happens only when you have respect for the person or the, for the other person and or his or her ideas. I'm saying and or because sometimes uh, it is possible to still listen to somebody you do not really have you don't, you don't know them too, too well or <clears throat> you do not have too much of respect for them, but the ideas that they bring to the table are ideas which, are, which, you, are, which, you, are, which you respect and which you are interested in. <clears throat> That's a, a bit of an exception, but the bottom line, the single word, the operating system, the platform on which all listening runs is respect for the individual, for the other person you are speaking to. And if you do not have that respect, then please be prepared to know that listening won't happen. 
then <clears throat> listening happens when you slow down your own reaction and you give full attention to the speaker now i'm spe i'm saying that because for most people we speak at a rate which is much faster than the rate at which we can assimilate and understand speech now there are people who speak very slowly and that's very tiresome to listen to so don't do that but normal speech people say it's roughly about 250 or so words a minute but our ability to take in those words and think about them and assimilate them and understand them is uh, much slower that was a blue jay raiding a, a sparrow uh, nest so i'm on the side of sparrows so when somebody is speaking they are speaking fast and when we are listening we are restrained and limited by our ability to listen to the to their words and to process them and understand them now let me throw in a couple more stones to stir up the water people's accents this the the, the um, matter that is being spoken about especially if it's a matter which uh, is controversial uh, if it's a matter which uh, hooks on to your emotions, make you sa makes you sad, glad, bad, mad. All of this further slows down and interferes with our ability to listen. Take for example, your <coughs> daughter comes home and says to you, Daddy, or mom, you always said that I should tell you, I should speak to you frankly. You always said that I should be open with you and I must not hide anything. Can you imagine what's going to happen? Can you imagine what's going to happen to you as a father or mother? I mean, these opening statements are like throwing, you know, a huge rock in the middle of the pond. And you're like sitting like, oh my God, oh my God, oh my God, oh, 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 what has she done, what has she done? And then she's going to say, well, you know, I, I, I think I lost my phone. <laughs> Can you imagine? All of these things affect our ability to listen and to process information. You listen also when you feel that you have something to gain, some benefit for yourself by listening. That's why most of us don't pay attention to politicians' speeches, unless they are for some special occasion. Listening also happens when <clears throat> there is a willingness to change, as I mentioned earlier. Listening also happens when what is being said sounds frame, uh, sounds fair in your frame of reference. And the key thing there is your frame of reference. So when you are speaking to somebody, think about it's so important to be in their, in their heart, in their mind, so that you know what their frame of reference is. Otherwise, what you are saying, they will not assimilate it and they will, they will fight it because it seems to be unfair to them even though to you it may seem very fair. So it's not enough for you to uh, believe it's fair, but it's very important for you to understand how do they see that. And finally, very, very, very important, listening happens when you are yourself aware of your own feelings and you are skilled in dealing with them. Now this is a big one because most of us are not aware of our own feelings. And most of us, are not skilled in dealing with our feelings. If I simply ask you a question just now, tell me what are you feeling now? I doubt if you can really tell me what you're feeling. What you will tell me is what you are thinking. That comes out more easily. But feeling actual in the heart. Most of us are very out of touch with our hearts. And that's where we come to 
active listening or paraphrasing. Now, paraphrasing is a tool, it's a response tool to verify your understanding that the speaker has been understood the way he or she wants to be. Now, this is very, very important. It's very important that the speaker is understood the way they want to be understood. Tell me, has it happened to you? And I'm sure it's happened to you. It's happened to me many times. And I'll give you a, <clears throat> I'll give you a, um, an actual uh, incident as well. Has it happened to you that um, you gave instruction to somebody and you said to them, uh, have you understood that? And the person said, yes. Okay, now go do it. And the person does something the, op the opposite of what you told them to do. Has it happened to you? I was in Hyderabad in my, uh, at home. When a friend of mine called me and he said, um, he said, sir, can you uh, please come to my office right now? There is somebody here who I want you to meet and it's a, uh, it's an important thing. I need your advice. So can you please come? Are you free? Are you sure I'm free? But my car is not here just now. My wife's gone somewhere. So send, send your driver. He said, yeah, sure. No problem. I'll send my driver. So I got ready and I'm waiting and I'm waiting and I'm waiting. And it's, you know, half an hour passes and 45 minutes pass. Now this person, this friend of mine, his office was like 10 minutes away from my house. Right? By, uh, if you drove, it's about 10 minutes drive away. 10, 15 minutes, but 45 minutes, no sign of this guy. Then I get a call again and his friend says to me, Sheikh, what's, uh, what's the matter? What's happened? Are you, are you not coming? I said, I'm waiting. I'm waiting for the last 45 minutes. Where's your driver? He says, God, I don't know what. He said, hold on, let, let, let me uh, get back to you. And then 10 minutes later, his driver comes rings the bell, I get in the car and I, and as I'm driving, as he's driving me to the, to his, uh, uh, to his boss's office, I asked him, I said, what happened, where were you? He said, sir, you know, I made a mistake. I said, what happened? He said, my boss told me, go and bring Sheikh Yawa. I asked him, where is he? He said, at home. So I went to his house. He went to his boss's house. Now, his boss is, as I said, he's a good friend of mine. So I, I'm in and out of their house and he's in and out of my house. So this driver just assumed, he said, Sheikh, where is he at home? At home, he meant at his home. So this guy went and he's parked outside his boss's house. He's waiting for me to come out. Now, why would I be in his boss's house when the boss is in the office? I mean, that's a different thing. But the point being, did the man understand what instruction he, he had been given? Yes. Did he understand it the way the instruction was given? Did he understand it the way his boss wanted him to understand? No. Now this happens all the time. We think we have been understood, but we have not been understood. And since the, since the person that we are speaking to, which includes us, we don't come with a digital readout here telling us what's going into the brain. We have no idea what that person has understood unless that person communicates, unless that person shares their understanding with us. And that is why paraphrasing is so important. Paraphrasing is also important. and I'm t In a minute, I'll tell you how to do that. But it's also important because it focuses on the content of the speech and involves integrating what you think the speaker said and getting verification that your understanding was correct. Now, how to paraphrase? What's the technique? It has four elements. Number one, let the other person finish speaking. In case the other person speaks at a great length and you are afraid that you might miss something, then you can interrupt. And I'll tell you in a minute how to do that. Um, and paraphrase. So first uh, point, let the person finish speaking. Number two, state what you think they said as you understood it. Right? That's very important. Tell them what you think you understood. I understand you to be saying. That's the key phrase before. 
I understand you to be saying, I say, take this driver and, and boss story that I tell you. If the driver had said, yes, sir, I understand you to be saying that you want me to pick up Sheikh Yabar from your house. Is that right? The matter would have been solved right there. The boss would have said, of course not. Sheikh Yabar is in his house. Pick him up from his house. Over. No problem. Instead of that, what happened there? Did you understand? Yes, he's gone. The boss does not know what he understood. It's not a matter of being stupid. It's not a question of saying the man is stupid. And so, no, he's not stupid. He just understood something from his frame of reference. That is it. So state what you think they said as you understood it. Number three. Now what will happen? One or two things. The speaker will say, yes, that's right. Or the speaker will say, no, that's not right. This is what I meant. Now, if the speaker uh, agrees, then continue the conversation. Okay, so that, now what? I understood this. Now what? If the speaker disagrees, don't argue with them. Because remember that their version is the correct version. You are trying to understand them. You're not arguing with them. It's not a debate. So quickly, once again, the four points. Let the other person finish speaking, state what you think you understood. If the speaker confirms that, continue. If the speaker does not confirm, if the speaker corrects you, then stand corrected, don't argue. Now, active listening happens when four things happen. Number one, you share your understanding with the speaker. Number two, very importantly, you Remember the data. You remember exactly what was said. And that is why the importance of, of taking notes. We'll come to that in a minute. So you share your understanding with the speaker. You remember exactly what was said. When you verify the interpretations you make about what is being said. So if you are making an interpretation, you, you verify that. And number four is when you verify the assumptions you're making about the speaker. There are two kinds of things. One is interpretation about what they said and two is assumption about the speaker, who he or she is. What does that mean to you? Uh, and in the context of who they are or who you think they are, um, how does that affect your, uh, your communication itself? So this is a uh, very important element of uh, active listening. Now, there are four steps to active listening and each one involves a separate skill. It's important that to be proficient in all and to use them consciously uh, if you want to listen. So that's something that I want to uh, leave with you. The first and foremost of those steps is the intention. It is the intention, the conscious intention to listen. Everything begins with the intention. In this case, the conscious intention to listen. So ask yourself this question, do I want to listen? Now that's very important because a lot of times we, um, we just assume that I, I, I must listen, I have to listen. And by listen, I mean also we assume that I have to listen right now. This person is here, that that person may have that expectation. Uh, they might come and say, I want to talk to you. The meaning, that I want to talk to you right now and therefore I want you to just drop everything you are doing and listen to me. So I'm here now doing brain surgery and you say, I want, I want to talk to you and I must drop the whole thing and let this guy die on the, on, on the table and I must listen to you. No, that doesn't work. That does not happen. So if you, are, uh, if you are engaged with something which is so critical and you cannot listen to the other person at that point in time, then say so, right? So ask yourself, do I need to listen? Number one. Number two, ask yourself, do I want to listen? Again, with both, including here and now. And if the answer to either of these or both of these is, no, I don't want to listen. Uh, I don't need to listen. Meaning, I'm not the right person. This is something should go to so-and-so. Number two, I may be the right person, but this is not the right time. Then do yourself a favor and do the other guy a favor. Tell them politely that you are not the best person for them to talk to or that this is not the best time. Fix another time 
or send them to somebody else who is or would be the right person for them to talk to. Now remember to do this with concern, right? Don't just kick them out of the place. Believe me, this is far less painful and more positive than going through the motions of listening, pretending to listen, when you believe that you either don't even need to listen or you don't want to listen or you have no respect for this person or you don't care about them, it is a, that is very painful. Don't do that. That person doesn't deserve that. You don't deserve that. Don't do that. So the first uh, of the four steps to active listening is to have the right intention. Second step is to focus. Now, this consists both of mental focus and even before that, a physical signaling of it. It means that you stop doing whatever you're doing. You ensure that there is no disturbance. Turn your phone off or silent. No uh, notifications. If you are working on your computer or whatever it is, shut that down. If you are reading, uh, reading some material or book, whatnot, shut it. Full attention, give them your full attention, lean slightly forward, eye contact, face to face, and look friendly, smile, it's not a crime, it's very important. And very importantly, as I mentioned to you, to be able to communicate, to be able to actively listen, you need good data, and good data means you need to remember what exactly what was said. Now, no matter how phenomenal you think your memory is, it is not that phenomenal. We forget, we confuse things, uh, we have, uh, I don't want to use too much of communication jargon, but there are words for all of this, uh, where we allow something that was said previously to influence something which is being said now or subsequently, um, and so on and so forth. So it is very important to take notes, actually write down. But be very careful, ask people's permission to take notes. So in this conversation, I would say, for example, thank you very much. I want to give you my full attention and I want to listen to you. And in order that I remember what you tell me and I can give you some intelligent responses, I would like to take notes. Is that okay? They will say, yes, it's okay. Nobody will say, no, 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 you can't take notes. Please forget, please confuse. No, but ask. Because if you are, without asking, if you are scribbling on a pad or something like this, it's very distracting and it's disrespectful as far as the speaker is concerned and the person can, they can be misunderstanding with regard to that. The person may say, look, I'm not interested in talking to this person because he, is, he or she is not even interested in listening to me. They are doing their doodling on the, on their, uh, maybe they are drawing cartoons of me or something. I mean, you know, they don't know that. So tell them specifically, um, I would like to take notes. And on the other hand, remember, if you don't take notes, and especially if the matter is unfamiliar, especially if the matter is going to raise uh, questions and, and anxieties and fears and, 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 and whatnot in your heart, right? Then you will lose track and you will not retain data, which is negative. And you will not be useful in this conversation. So taking notes is a very good strategy. Taking notes also indicates that you are interested in the speaker, you are interested in the whole thing, in that, in, in that meeting, and you have respect for people. So it's a very good thing to take notes. Another very good thing is to agree on a time frame for the meeting. Right? It's not from now until kingdom come. It, it, I can give you, uh, let's, let's decide, uh, let's uh, take a call at 30 minutes, right? Or uh, one hour, uh, not, not 10 hours, please. So, you usually 30 minutes is a, is a good time frame because most people um, have a tough time keeping their attention focused after 30 minutes. So even if you have to continue, decide, okay, we, we're going to stop now. Uh, let's take a walk, get a cup of coffee, you know, uh, go to the fluid exchange, uh, whatnot, and then come back here. But make sure that uh, you fix a time frame uh, for the meeting. And always ask, can we, shall we do that? Can we do this? Can we fix a time frame? Uh, don't, don't just say, uh, uh, let's do this. Or, or um, you know, I, I, I will give you 30 minutes. No, uh, be, be very polite and be, be kind. Now, third step is check for understanding. 
So what were the first two steps? Correct intention. Number two is focus. And in order to keep focus, we take notes and so on. So the third one is check for understanding. Now, as I mentioned to you before, um, this consists of sharing what you understood with the speaker. It's a very critical step and sometimes it seems cumbersome um, and uh, it's something that most people don't do. But the thing is, as I said, you know, the, the, the only way that we can let the other person know uh, whether we understood them or not is by sharing that understanding. So I so say that I understand you to be saying that unless I share my understanding with the speaker, she will not be able to tell whether I have understood her in the way she wants me to or not. Is that correct? Now, this is how you would paraphrase me in this case. Right? Now, think about this. See, see, how, see what I mean by cumbersome. It, 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 it's a lot of words. But believe me, if there was a shorter or easier way that I knew, I would tell you. Paraphrasing does some other good things. It gives a speaker a pause to take a breath. It builds trust between you and the person that he or she feels understood. And you are then able to, uh, you can also therefore by doing this, you can demonstrate your commitment to the meeting by showing that you are all attention. Right? Now, to paraphrase successfully, uh, you will need to be attentive. Uh, you can't do that in your in your sleep and the fourth uh, point so first one intention second one focus third one share your understanding and fourth one is support now there's some usually some some confusion about this to support does not mean that you agree or you accept what's being said it means merely to create a supportive environment where the person feels valued and accepted and not judged or evaluated or condemned right or found wanting so that is a very important thing because unless a person feels um, feels supported uh, and uh, you know they, they feel that uh, they are being understood uh, they, they will not share any more information now supporting behavior consists of making the person comfortable so if you are sitting for example in, in, in I'm talking about an official situation, if you're sitting behind one, you know, some people have these vast desks, um, then come out from behind it. Don't have this big thing, barrier between you and the other person. Um, depending on the nature of the conversation, it might even be a good idea to find a neutral place to have your meeting where you will not be disturbed, but it is not your turf as it were, right? So if you, if you summon somebody into your office, into your, uh, even into your home, for example, to talk to them, uh, into your study in your home that has a certain effect but if you go sit on a park bench or you go uh, to a restaurant uh, or you go to the to um, you know um, some other neutral place uh, where you will have the ability of, don't go into a library and start talking because people will throw you out uh, go uh, go to a place where you can talk uh, and where you will have privacy but it's neither your turf nor their turf this uh, helps to uh, loosen the, uh, the, the, the restraints to, uh, to frank speech and then pay attention and ask questions that will lead the speaker to think of things that they may not have thought earlier. Now, you don't need to push. Uh, it is counterproductive to push. It is, it is, it is uh, actually negative to push. Just ensure that you are giving the impression that you're all there and you are happy and you're willing and you're able to listen. Now, so usually such questions would be, um, oh, that, that's interesting. Um, but did you consider this? Uh, what about that? <clears throat> did you read this particular book? You know, the thing that you're telling me about reminds me of this book. Have you, have you read that book? Um, did you, uh, what else could you have done in that situation? Things like this. Now make sure that your questions are always open-ended, right? Uh, open-ended, non-judgmental, and as far as possible, try to keep your own agenda out of it. The whole active listening communication meeting is not about trying to convince that person to do, to do this or that. That may happen as a result of that meeting. I mean, no doubt about that. But that is not the reason you are having that meeting. You're, that meeting is to build understanding and to help that person evolve and evolve their own uh, answers and their own solutions 
to whatever it is that you are talking about. So, uh, if you are doing it right, now this is some indicators for you. If you are doing it right, you will see the speaker become more at ease and open up further. Now, if you see the speaker becoming defensive or justifying what he or she is saying, then you can usually be sure that they are picking up your opinion and they are trying to correct for it. And in that case, back off. Back off and correct yourself first. Anytime that you get the feeling that you know precisely what this person's problem is and what the solution is, remember that most people know what to do. As I said in, the, in, in my opening statement, that lovely, um, that lovely paragraph by, written by somebody, if you tell me what to do, then you are doing me a disfavor. You are just, uh, you are trampling over my feelings, you are creating dependency in me. Help me to arrive at the right solution. Don't tell me what to do. Especially, for example, in, in uh, cases, for example, parent-child discussions. Uh, for example, uh, uh, manager-employee uh, discussions. If you really know your job as a parent or a manager, it is more than likely, I would say almost 100% of the time, mostly you know what the problem with your child is or you know what the problem with your subordinate is and you know the, and you know the solution. But believe it or not, if you tell them to do that, it won't work. It will not work. And you might say this is very perverse and this is crazy, but that's how human beings are. You must go and suffer the pain of allowing them to arrive at that conclusion which you want them to conclude. And this is not manipulative behavior. It's not. You need to be open to the fact that they might come up with a solution which you never thought of and that would be absolutely wonderful. You are empowering them to find solutions. You are not spoon feeding them. You are not stuffing it down their throat. And that is a very, very important uh, differentiation to make. Right? They are, remember this, they are only looking for support to help them face the decisions that they know they should take. They're not looking for answers. They know the answers. And in any case, nobody commits to an answer that is from the outside. The only way that you will get them to do what they should do is to let them come to that conclusion on their own. And this is true no matter how painful that process might be. So, in summary, intention. Ask yourself, do I need or want to listen? Set a time and place or suggest, or suggest alternate time or person if required. Number two, focus. Show that you are in, interested, physical. Be aware of your body language. Prevent interruptions of any kind. Take notes after taking permission to take notes. Number three, paraphrase. Check if they understood you. So be willing to be corrected. If you have not understood them as they want to be understood. Don't argue. And don't contradict. And number four, support. Create a supportive atmosphere. Make them comfortable. Ask open-ended questions. Clarification questions. Not, don't signal opinions or judgments. Now, <clears throat> what are the blocks to listening? Right? You might say, well, all of this sounds... Uh, it sounds good and um, quite obvious really. So why is it, why is listening such a big problem? Why don't people listen? What are the blocks to listening? Number one, your own past experience, which can be your experience with that person, which is usually the case in parent-child communication and in communication between spouses, also usually the case between communication between manager and subordinates. There is a previous history, whether you like it or not, that previous history is going to color uh, your listening and it's going to color the communication and it can make it very ineffective. So we call this also selective data gathering and that is something to look out for. It's how our own opinions, especially prejudice, colors our communication because we operate from assumptions instead of real-time here and now data. And as they say, if you assume A-S-S-U-M-E, you make an ass of you and me. Now, selective data gathering is very powerful because it is unconscious. Selective data gathering is very powerful because it is unconscious. 
and that's why it's very important for us especially in potentially conflictful or potentially controversial communication very important to ask yourself what are my assumptions about this person and then clarify those assumptions now most of us operate with labels so manager union leader communist muslim jew hindu christian child old fogey whatever each of these labels comes with whatever is in that package taken from our life where we collect what happens with an individual and put it into a package labeled not with his or her name but with their group as we see it how many times has it happened to you that you de and, and i'm talking about usually this happens both positive and negative but it's a human tendency to remember negative more than positive you have a good experience with a person you meet this muslim guy and uh, you have a great conversation and you you know you love the person you say oh muslims are wonderful people now i i, I wish that is true i mean <laughs> i would like to tell you that muslims are wonderful people but i would be lying if i told you that i would be lying also if i told you that muslims are nasty people the truth is muslims are people that's it they are neither nasty people nor are they wonderful people they are people and like people you have got good muslims and you got bad muslims so the issue is you met this individual who was a muslim and your good experience is with that individual but most of us and i'm just using muslims as a a uh, way of illustrating that this applies across the board we label with groupings and that is a very problematic thing because labels create prejudice so never label and in the conversation we are looking at the issue of selective data gathering and past experience the degree to which you are aware of how your past experience may be influencing that conversation to that degree you will have a great conversation the second one is what i call the dialogue of the deaf when both the people are so intent on making their own point that they don't bother to listen what the other one is saying one of the classic giveaway signs of dialogue of the deaf is when both people are speaking at the same time you have believe me this happens so often it's not funny when two people are speaking at the same time neither of them is listening because we cannot talk and listen at the same time number 3 is familiarity when you think you know someone so well that you know what he or she is going to say until of course you wipe the egg off your face there is a wonderful story about the about the US president Harry Truman where uh, he was talking to somebody uh, in the um, oval office in the white house and uh, this person said harry i know exactly what you're going to do and the story goes that harry truman got up from his chair he did a somersault on the carpet and he said i bet you didn't think i would do that now that's a wonderful story even if it's not true because it tells you that when you think you know exactly what somebody is going to say or do very often you are very very wrong maybe they used to do that or maybe they did that 100 times or 99 times but that one day that one time they are saying something very different and if you are not listening to them you are not going to get that so this familiarity is a big problem Sec third one is attention span most people have the attention span of goldfish which is 3 seconds but definitely 30 seconds is about the maximum attention span and therefore if you are talking at length you are going to lose people in paraphrasing that is why it's a good idea every 30 seconds to say excuse me uh, let me tell you what i understood this is how i understood you so every 30 seconds do that it gives them also you know breathing time uh, helps them to understand and builds trust between them because bit <coughs> when you do that <clears throat> the other person knows that you're making an effort to listen to them to understand them and you they're also getting an a, a, a online understanding of what's going on in your mind so this is a a, a huge um 
confidence building exercise. Then the fourth one uh, and the <coughs> fourth and last one is uh, what I call skimming uh, or um, selective hearing. When some trigger words set off a bunch of feelings or memories and you react to them and you jump to conclusions instead of what is being said in entirety in the here and now. Now this is very powerful again because some of these things from, from our past are so traumatic that they trigger feelings of anger and grief, even hatred. And this is all unconscious. So it's very, very powerful. That is the reason why we need to be aware of ourselves and our feelings. Uh, that's so important to do that. But remember that all that you are reaction uh, is you're rea reacting to is from something in your past uh, with whom, with somebody, something in your past, uh, with whatever history there is. It has nothing to do with whoever you are talking to now. In your conversation, therefore, be on the lookout and always remember there are some trigger words. Be on the lookout for trigger words and the reactions that they are likely to trigger and consciously stop that reaction. Remind yourself that that person you are speaking to has nothing to do with whatever happened in your past. Stay with the present. Many times we, anti we, we interpret people <coughs> we, we interpret people and what they say in a negative sense, right? Because this, this is our trigger word. I'll tell you some fun, funny thing happened with me, with me once. I was teaching a course for GE uh, in, um, in India. And usually what I do is when I begin my class, I introduce myself. And there is a, there is a, uh, it's, I'm not trying to show off or something. It, there's a good reason because you need to, you need to give people a reason to listen to you. And wh why must I listen to you? Because I'm wearing a red hat? No. You need to know who I am. What is my background? What is my qualification? Uh, if I'm speaking to you about a subject, uh, is it somebody that, am I somebody that uh, you need to pay attention to or am I an expert or you know, I, you, somebody just found me uh, sitting under a tree or what? So I have a slide, a, a PowerPoint slide, which has my qualifications and my client list and, and various things, uh, you know, where I studied uh, and all this. So I have this uh, thing. I, I usually put it up, saves me a bunch of talking. So I, I put it up and I tell people, please take a look at that. And uh, uh, any questions, I'm happy to answer. So this class started um, 8.30 a.m. Uh, we went through this. And then I got into my subject and I'm, uh, I'm, I'm talking about my subject, which was leadership. And uh, we had say, about half an hour passed when one man came in. Now, he came late, obviously. So he came in. Uh, he came in and he sat down. Now, after about 10, 15 minutes of that, he puts up his hand. I said, yes. I'm not exaggerating. He says, what's your qualification? Just like this. What's your qualification? Now, this was like almost like slapping me in the face. What's your qualification? The, uh, the immediate assumption was in my, in my head was, oh, you're questioning my qualification. I mean, you, you, don't, you don't think I am fit to be taking this class. And then I, in, now, all this is happening to me internally. So I said to myself, oh, hold on, hold on. This man is asking me for my qualification. So I did not even respond. I did not even speak. I just hit the back button three, four times until it came to my CV slide. Like there's no speech. He's asked me, what's your qualification? Tick, tick, tick. So he reads the CV slide. He said, oh, thank you very much. That's it. Go on. And I thought to myself, why did he speak like that? Now, whatever reason he had for speaking like that, my the, the best assumption I can put on it is that here, here was a guy who uh, doesn't know how to ask questions. Right? That's it. Or worst case scenario, maybe he looked at me, maybe whatever assumptions he made, maybe whatever prejudices he had, um, maybe he even wanted to, within quotes, prove to the world that I was unfit to take the class. But Alhamdulillah, he saw my qualifications and so on and he just said, thank you very much. Now, I, I don't think that really was it. I think he just didn't know how to, how to ask a question. So this can happen. So be, it's very important to stay in touch and be in touch with your feelings and to not to react from your past history, but to stay with the here and now, because that is the only thing which matters. 
Finally, active listening can and should be used in every significant communication. I have used active listening in uh, marriage counseling. I have used active listening in raising of children, counseling parents on how to talk to children. I have uh, counseled children how to talk to parents. I have used active listening in management union negotiations with militant communist unions and I am still for 16 years in Guyana and in India and I am here uh, alive and well to tell you the tale. Active listening is a very, very powerful tool which I hope you will use. And as I said, it must be used no matter even though it seems to be a bit cumbersome but it must be used in every significant communication, especially in potentially conflictful, stressful, controversial, adversarial and sensitive situations. Uh, these may include, but this is not restricted to management union negotiations, conflict resolution, arbitration, reconciliation, communication between spouses, parents, children, managed subordinates, uh, especially when giving critical feedback um, and so on and so forth. Now, as I said, I've, I've used active listening in, in many, many situations. Um, it will, it, or it, it um, opens the doors for successful conflict resolution because it narrows the areas of disagreement. And you can then approach the issue from, we have so much in common, so I'm sure we can resolve this one matter satisfactorily. Active listening is especially effective with children to bridge the generation um, gap, right? It is especially effective with children. Uh, and this is the bridge across the generation gap. Active listening lets you be the student and lets, uh, and it allows your child um, to open the door into their world. Active listening is a real expression of respect for the other. It builds trust and you will find when you listen actively that you build better relationships and open the doors of understanding because you get insights into life and thinking of the other person and you can resolve conflicts and situations which may have seemed hopeless. I wish you all the best and welcome to share your comments, welcome to share your experiences as you practice active listening. I look forward to hearing from you and thank you very much.